Good morning and welcome to Global Health Pass, brought to you by Global Health Press. Once a week, we bring to you news on vaccines and vaccination. I am Joe Schmidt, and with me, as always, is Dr. Melvin Senecas. Good morning to Switzerland. Good morning, Melvin. Good morning, Professor Schmidt. Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening to those who are watching us today. We have only three topics today, and uh, they are quite important, and you will immediately see why that is. We talk about COVID, global epidemiology, frequently asked questions on COVID, and then on a new topic that is emerging, but which is an old topic, which is vaccination and pregnancy. Let's start with Melvin. Melvin, what's news on COVID? I'm surprised. I see everything is going down. Why do we have it here today? Yes, so um, globally over 1 million new COVID cases and over 3,000 deaths were reported in the last 28 days. Um, just to remind our viewers that um, the WHO has changed their reporting. Previously it was weekly and then it became bi-weekly. Now it's every four weeks, right? So we don't really see the change as much as before. Um, Five of the WHO regions have reported decreases in the number of both cases and deaths, but the Western Pacific region has reported an increase in the number of cases. Um, also to remind people that the reported cases do not actu accurately represent infection rates um, because of significant reductions in testing and of course in the reporting to the WHO. So let's look a little, little bit at the map. You said Western Pacific region. And if I look at the map, this is largely Southeast Asia and Korea. Yes. So this is giving us basically the um, confirmed COVID cases over the last 28 days. And at the country level, the highest numbers of new cases are reported in Korea, in Brazil, in Australia, in New Zealand and Singapore. And that's the reason why the Western Pacific region um, in general of the WHO, they are reporting um, increase in cases because of the increase in cases in Korea um, and Australia and in Singapore. So the change in the reporting intervals going from weekly to monthly that makes it very difficult to see if there is an increase, right? If there is a slow increase, we will not pick it up. Either. And yeah, how plus about the fact that, um, for example, for deaths, right? So, um, it, it, for for deaths, what we normally see is cases first, and then two to three weeks after, you will see the deaths, right? But because there is this delay in reporting now, which is around four weeks you don't really see that clearly as, as, as clearly as before. Yeah, so um, that's where we are. We are waiting for autumn to come and let's see if there will be further increases. I would predict there is, but let's see. Melvin, you have prepared questions that are frequently asked on COVID and uh, maybe you can run us through the questions. Yes, so these are questions that um, came from several people on social media um, and just personally sending questions to me, for example, on, on LinkedIn or an, an email. And so these are the top uh, five questions that we will be answering today. So first is how long will the symptoms of uh, COVID last? Um, basically the length of your symptoms will depend on a lot of factors, including whether you're up to date with your vaccinations, boosters and whether you take Paxlovid if you are a high risk person, right? Um, some people will feel better after a few days, two, three days, and some people will still have symptoms after 10 days, possibly even more than that. But um, so yeah, it, it depends on a lot of factors. Uh, but if you start to experience severe symptoms, even if you're fully vaccinated and boosted, you should go um, see your, uh, your doctor. So coming back to one of our previous editions of Global Healthcast, I remember it is largely people older than 65 or even 80 years who are at risk for severe disease. And I guess that would be those and those who are immunosuppressed or pregnant who would have the symptoms of COVID for the most long, for the longest periods, right? 
Yeah, so um, the, the UK Joint Committee on Vaccination and Immunization just recently published their um, recommendation for, for vaccination in the fall. And they really specified the risk groups are the pregnant women, older people, um, age 65 and above, immunocompromised, and some frontline workers. Yeah. Let's go to the next question, which is who should take medications and where do you get it? Yes. So um, Paxlovid is an antiviral treatment for COVID. Um, there is broad evidence-based scientific consensus that using it reduces the risk of being hospitalized or dying. Um, and it may also reduce the chance of developing long COVID in some patients. It is a five-day course of medication taken twice daily. And the treatment has to begin within five days of developing symptoms. Um, and for this, it depends on the country where you are. Um, there are countries where Paxlovid can be easily obtained um, with, uh, with your doctor uh, in a prescription. Okay, so uh, you have to go by country and then you uh, and um, you should ask a healthcare professional how to, if necessary, how to get medication for uh, COVID. Now, the next question, how long are you contagious with COVID? We covered that before, I remember, but maybe there are new insights. Yes, at the moment, evidence suggests that you are definitely contagious for the, for the first five days after you start to develop symptoms or get a positive test. And in those five days, it is important to stay home and isolate as much as possible. Beyond that, you, you, can as, you assume that you're still infectious as long as you're getting a positive result on a, a home test. Um, if you've re reached the five-day threshold and you're feeling better and you are fever-free without medication, it's generally considered safe for you to go out. And not infect others. So you yes. can go out and there is no risk for others. That is important for those who want to visit their parents in a nursery home, or if you want to go, if you are employed at a hospital or want to be a visitor uh, to a hospital to visit a friend or family member in the hospital. Very good. So let's go to the next question. How long are you immune after having COVID? You know, for this, the guidance used to be that you were considered immune and should not have to test again within 90 days or three months after you had an infection. Now it's actually 30 days, but that's just a guideline and not a definite scientific consensus. There is a widely reported meta-analysis in The Lancet uh, showing many people have antibodies in their blood even 10 months after an infection. But again, the presence of antibodies alone does not mean you can't develop a symptomatic infection, right? It just means your odds uh, of being infected are, are lower. And also to keep in mind that reinfection protection was shown to be lower for the Omicron variant. But I guess the message here is that um, it's good to be vaccinated and boosted, even if you've been infected, because those who have um, what you call the hybrid immunity, which means you have been vaccinated and you have been infected and you've recovered, they have better um, immune protection from, from COVID. Mm -hmm. We covered in the past that there's a difference between immunity and protection. So uh, immunity does not mean infection. And this is what you're saying. Again, even if you have antibodies, you may still not be protected. And maybe even, and that is, I guess, well, less well documented, if you have no antibodies, you may still not come down with COVID, right? Mm -hmm. Anyway, so this is uh, the question number four. And the last question would be, is there any way to avoid or prevent long COVID? You know, for this, the, the scientific world is still in the early stages of determining what really constitutes long COVID, who's most, most at risk, and which possible preventive measures are most effective. But a study recently published in JAMA Internal Medicine suggested that an overall healthy lifestyle, adequate nutrition and sleep, regular exercise, moderate alcohol consumption could lower women's risk of developing long COVID. And another study published in Cell identified four risk factors, including type two diabetes. So the primary way to avoid long COVID is to really not catch COVID in the first place and boosters and masks are still valuable tools for, for anyone looking to reduce the risk this, this summer and fall. Um, although 
people are now not required to wear masks. If you think that you are high risk, I, I, I think it still helps to wear a mask, especially if you're in a crowded places where you don't know whether people there have been vaccinated or have immunity or not. Very interesting. Thank you very much for these great questions. And maybe you have more of these for our next edition of Global Healthcast. Great. I have one topic today, which is vaccination in pregnancy. And I guess I have to introduce the problem first. Once a woman becomes pregnant, there are immune adaptations. And the reason for that is the antigens in the baby are 50% from the father. So they are non-self or foreign antigens to the mother. So in order to save the baby from attacks of the immune system, the specific adaptive immune cells are downregulated. As you can see here, CD4, CD8, B cells, natural killer and cytotoxicity, there is a downregulation. At the same time, adaptive immune responses, unspecific immune responses, they go up. In the end, there is increased severity and for some infections, increased susceptibility for uh, severe disease. So uh, this is changes that happen during each pregnancy. There is a nice publication from some years ago. And actually what we see here is the, the, the concept of vaccination in pregnancy is not new. In 1960, for the first time, the Surgeon General in the United States recommended influenza vaccination for pregnant women in 1950, after the 1957-1958 pandemic. And that was because there were a lot of women with severe mobility and a high mortality. Now then later on, as of 2006, there was a recommendation to use Tdap boosters uh, postpartum to mothers and family members, cocooning strategy. Then the ACIP recommended uh, Tdap during pregnancy as of 2011. And now uh, Tdap is recommended late during pregnancy. That's when you get best efficacy of Tdap vaccine, actually up to 95%, I will show you later on. Now also COVID-19 is recommended during pregnancy. So there is a history of vaccination pregnancy since 1960. But first, let's look at the increased risk and uh, the increased susceptibility and severity you see here. Listeriosis and HIV, there is an increased susceptibility of pregnant women, and that has to do with the fact that there was a downregulation of the T-cell system, right? Listeria monocytogenous is a typical T-cell dependent organisms, and pregnant women are highly susceptible for this particular organism. But there's also the increased disease severity, as you can see here, for many infectious diseases. So now let's bring the two together, a downregulation of the immune system during pregnancy, increased susceptibility and disease severity that results in, um, um, this results in increased risk. And that's why you want to vaccinate. Now, the one concern if you vaccinate during pregnancy is malformations in the newborn. You vaccinate and then the, the vaccine is, so to speak, a teratogen, and then you see malformations. And here is data on unvaccinated um, uh, newborns. So the mothers were not vaccinated during pregnancy. There are two data sets, one from the University of Mainz and one from a European data set. And what you see here in normal pregnancies, before any recommendation of vaccination, the frequency of malformations in newborns is 6.9%. And that is, you find this number if you have a well-trained pediatrician and an ultrasound machine with this pediatrician, and then they find 7%, which is a high number. Now, the concern is you vaccinate during pregnancy, you find malformation at birth, and then you say, this is due to the vaccine that was used in pregnancy. Now, this is not the case, and uh, the, the story is a little bit more complicated. We have now 60 years of experience, since the 1960s with influenza. We have 60 years of experience with adverse events of vaccination during pregnancy, and there are more than four, these are four that I choose, uh, systems to detect um, malformations or detect adverse events uh, followed by vaccination during pregnancy. 
And in the end, what it boils down to that the American culture of obstetrician and gynecology, the American NITEC, the Centers for Disease Control and WHO, they conclude there is no evidence of any increased risk of adverse pregnancy, fetal or infant outcomes following vaccination of pregnant individuals with inactivated influenza vaccines, pertussis containing vaccines or COVID-19 vaccines. So this is the current knowledge. And again, this is a total of 60 years experience, more than 10 years experience with Tdap and a few years with COVID as well. So it is at this point, there is no safety concern for vaccination during pregnancy. And this, uh, I guess we will cover a little bit more in one of the following sessions, um, uh, what to do during pregnancy. How does vaccination during pregnancy protect the newborn? This is achieved by active pumping uh, of IgG from the mother to the blood of the newborn. And you see this increases with the age of the unborn. And by week 40, you have highest IgG, uh, maternal IgG in the blood of the newborn. And this is how, I lo how it looks like. Maternal antibodies are actively pumped into the unborn. After birth, these antibodies wane because they have a half-life of, let's say, 30 days. And at the same time, IgG is produced in the child, right? This is pediatric or the, the child's own IgG. And here you see it also develops IgM and IgA. And the total antibody uh, amount is shown here. So the nadir is at around three, four months, and then antibodies go up again. Now, with vaccination during pregnancy, you cover particularly this first four to six months to give antibodies to the child, but not only in the blood, I don't show this here, but also with breastfeeding. So I think overall there is good news and uh, there, this is a not new way, it is an old way to protect. And as said, it is working nicely. Here, pertussis vaccination, if given late during pregnancy, the efficacy is 91%, um, the effectiveness is 91% here in this study from the United Kingdom. This was a path force uh, a rapid ride through a vaccination during pregnancy, just as a beginning, and we'll have more of that in the near future. Melvin, any questions on this uh, or any any additional topics you want to cover here? No, not specifically for this one, but I, I think it's really now very interesting, and I'm sure we will be covering in future um, global health casts because there are lots of data now for vaccination in pregnant women for flu that has been ongoing for decades, and then now with uh, the newer vaccines for RSV. So I, I think that would be very interesting. Yeah, perhaps one item to remember, these vaccines are recommended to be used during pregnancy. They are not licensed, right? But we also don't have a license for any vaccine for patients with no hair, with black hair or brown hair, blue eyes or green eyes. So there is no license for any vaccine at this point to be given during pregnancy, but they are recommended to be used. So this is a, a slight important uh, detail that is uh, relevant. And I guess this brings us to our conclusion. We showed you that uh, the global epidemiology of COVID-19 is changing with a little bit more cases now in some countries, specifically in the Western Pacific region. COVID Frequently asked questions were covered by Melvin. I don't repeat them. And I gave you a quick start on vaccination during pregnancy, an old concept that will be new developed. Before we finish, Melvin came up with a nice cartoon. Melvin, maybe you can run us through this. Yes, so just a disclaimer, I did not make this cartoon. I saw this somewhere. So we are actually giving credit to whoever created this one, but this is just funny. This is a different versions of Mona Lisa, right? You will see here that when you have the idea of your research or your study conceptualized in the, the, the mind of the principal investigator, you will see that it's the version on the upper left. And then the version described in the grant proposal, of course, is more colorful and has more details. After getting the, the fund, you will see that uh, the study has actually shrunk because you, you have not really calculated the, the correct budget, right? And it 
and the money you have is not enough. And what is understood by your research assistant or your research uh, fellows is actually quite blurry. And then when you look at your first experiment, you, you will see that the result is very different from what you want to do in the first place. And then when you repeat your experiment, is it's it's different, but it's as um, it's as weird and uh, having this disheveled look, right? <laughs> now, how does it go on? Yeah, but when you present it in conferences, it's like the best version ever. And when you submit <laughs> it to the journal, you have to show a um, a cool and and sexy side just for your journal to accept and for the news to the, the news outlets to, to cover your story and then once you actually publish it and you've re, re addressed comments from reviewers then you you will have this it's totally different from from the yeah. from the rest very funny to whoever created this congratulations very nice thank you melvin for picking this up this was our global half cast 45 um, I wish you a very good week. See you again next week. I am Joe Schmidt and with me was Melvin Senecas. Thank you, everyone. Stay safe.